In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today's Gospel affords some difficulty both to interpreters and to the average hearer. For after our Lord is finished with the description of the end of the world, he says very solemnly, Amen, I say to you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass, but my word shall not pass. So that, that is a problem for interpreters. If this is about the end of the world, well, then why does he say that? The explanation becomes clear when we look at the following verse. But of that day and hour no one knoweth. No, not the angels of heaven, but the Father alone. He said that in another place. So, because the apostles were saying, when is the end of the world? And he said, no one knows. So we have a clear juxtaposition of this generation and these things versus that day. So if you look at this gospel, there is, he uses this and that. So he's referring to two things here. The scene of these predictions is the temple itself. Shortly after his glorious and triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Our Lord has just finished with the seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees. Just as there are seven Beatitudes, so there are seven woes. They are in the Gospel of St. Matthew, where he excoriates them. He calls them whitened sepulchers, full of dead man's bones and all filthiness. He, he just tears them apart. And he tells them because, that because of their blindness, they will bring down upon Jerusalem a terrible destruction. He said to them, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered together thy children as the hen doth gather her chickens under her wings, and thou wouldst not. Behold, your house shall be left to you desolate. Then he left the temple. But his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. But he said to them, Do you see all these things? Amen, I say to you, there shall not be left here a stone upon a stone that shall not be destroyed. Later, when he was sitting in, uh, upon, the, on, upon Mount Olivet, because they retired from the temple to Mount Olivet, which is very close to Jerusalem, his disciples came to him and asked him, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the consummation of the world? So they are asking him two distinct questions. When shall these things be, referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the consummation of the world? Two different questions. And our Lord answers the second question first. <clears throat> That is the end of the world question. In our Lord's response, we must understand that the destruction of Jerusalem was a foreshadowing of the end of the world. They are very similar <clears throat> uh, with regard to the first, that is the destruction of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the temple in Jerusalem and of Jerusalem in general. These two events are very similar, both with regard, with regard to the destruction itself and its severity, the, uh, and with regard to the cause of the destruction of Jerusalem, and the symptoms which herald the coming both of the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world. So there, there is a prefiguration here. Just as the Old Testament is loaded with prefigurations, so this is a prefiguration of the end of the world, and I'll explain that to you. So, 
First of all, with regard to the severity, the destruction of Jerusalem was so terrifying that even the Roman general Titus was horrified by it. And now Romans were not, and especially military, were not in any way, uh, let's say, novices with regard to brutality and bloodshed. But he was horrified by it. And he even said something to the effect that the hand of God is in this. They were throwing bodies over the wall uh, because the people were starving to death. And there were factions in Jerusalem that were warring against each other. And what they did was destroy each other's uh, food supply. So they actually brought upon this famine upon themselves. And it got so bad that they were even eating their children. And this is, even, this is recorded in Josephus, what is known as the Jewish War. Uh, he was an eyewitness to it. And he said that the Romans actually found a woman eating her baby whom she had placed in the oven in order to eat him. That's how bad it was. It was, it was a frightful, horrid scene inside Jerusalem. And even the general Titus, who later was emperor, it was horrified by it. So it, the, 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 the end of the world and the destruction of Jerusalem from the point of view of the severity of it are very similar. With regard to the cause, the destruction of Jerusalem was the vengeance of God upon the Jews for having crucified Christ. See, St. Peter says that explicitly in the Acts of the Apostles that you, meaning those people who were alive and who called for his death, were the ones that crucified him. And the ultimate destruction upon the world will be the vengeance of God upon those who have apostatized from the same Christ, namely the Gentiles. So the Gentiles will have their guilt, their apostasy for having rejected Christ. And we see that before our eyes today. We live in a post-Christian paganism, which is far worse than a pre-Christian paganism. It's far more deliberate and pernicious. And with regard to the symptoms, the signs of the coming, the two things are very similar. The signs which precede the destruction of Jerusalem and those which will precede, precede the end of the world are the same. Namely, a great persecution of the faithful, the rise of false prophets and false Christs, and ultimately the Antichrist, and the abomination of the desolation in the holy place. Now, we just had the Pachamama idols in the holy place in, in Rome. Something that we never thought would, would happen, that idols and idolatry would be brought into St. Peter's Basilica. But in fact, it happened. In the Old Testament, abomination was always the word for idolatry. So the abomination of desolation, it's, when we look around at the church, we look around at society, there is desolation. It's, it's desolate. And so the abomination of desolation, it rings in our ears, these idols in St. Peter's Basilica, this building that is consecrated to the glory of God, which is the center of Roman Catholicism, had in it idolatry. Our Lord is therefore narrating these things in a prophetical manner. That is, not in a historical manner, in which the events are told in the order of time, as they would happen, but rather in the order of connection of events, one with the other. He is juxtaposing them. If we look at the parallel text of today's Gospel in St. Luke, we see uh, a more clear, a clearer separation of the events. First, our Lord enumerates the events that will lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, this is St. Luke. And then he says, But woe to them that are with child and give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon his people. 
and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captives into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles till the times of the nations be fulfilled. The times of the nations refers to the amount of time allotted to the Gentiles for their salvation. For our Lord says in St. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all nations, and then shall the consummation come. So when that time is done, the preaching of the gospel to all nations, that's when the consummation shall come. St. Paul says in, in the epistle to the Romans that when the fullness of the Gentiles should come in, then will be the time of the conversion of the Jews. Our Lord then, in St. Luke's narration, after having spoken of the destruction of Jerusalem, then speaks about the signs of the end of the world. He says, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon. These did not take place before the destruction of Jerusalem. So he's talking about a whole different thing. And in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, by reason of the roaring of the sea and of the waves, men withering away for fear and expectation of what shall come upon the whole world. For the powers of heaven shall be moved, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and majesty. But when these things come to pass, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is at hand. So in St. Luke, we see the clear distinction between the two events of which our Lord is speaking. But St. Matthew and St. Mark Add something which we do not find in St. Luke. The, that the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. This prophecy of Daniel occurs in two places. One in chapter 9 of Daniel in which the prophet clearly is speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus in 70 A.D. He says, and a people with their leader shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and there shall be in the temple the abomination of desolation, and the desolation shall continue even to the consummation and to the end. <coughs> That's exactly what happened. Now, Daniel is speaking about four or five hundred years before this happened. The other is in chapter 12, where Daniel is clearly speaking about the Antichrist and the end of the world. He says, but at that time Michael sh shall Michael rise up, the great prince who standeth for the children of thy people, and a time shall come such as never was from the time of the time that nations began even until that time. And from the time when the continual sacrifice will be taken away, the abomination unto desolation shall be set up, and there shall be a thousand two hundred ninety days. This clearly refers to the end of the world, and we exactly what he means, we're not sure by each of those things. <coughs> but the continual sacrifice certainly is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But the days are, are mysterious, whether that is, is sometimes when, when sacred scripture says days, it means years, actually. But th that's a little obscure. After the mention of the abomination of desolation, the narration in St. Matthew seems to mix events referring to the destruction of Jerusalem and those with the end of the world. So we have St. Matthew in today's gospel. But with careful attention, each can be distinguished one from the other. Our Lord finishes the discourse by saying to them, 
referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, which they shall see. (coughs) And from the fig tree learn a parable. When the branch thereof is now tender and the leaves come forth, you know that summer is nigh. So you also, when you shall see these things, know ye that it is nigh even at the doors. These things referring to destruction of Jerusalem. Amen, I say to you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Then he says, concerning the end of the world, but of that day and hour no one knoweth, no, (coughs) not the angels of heaven, but the Father alone. There's a clear delineation of those two things. So he's talking about two different events, but they are related by foreshadowing to reality. The Catechism of the Council of Trent says that there are three things which must happen before the end of the world. The first is the preaching of the gospel to the whole world. The second is a general apostasy from the faith. And the third is the appearance of the Antichrist. When the, the Catechism was written in the 1560s, none of these things had taken place. Today we can say with certitude that the first and the second have taken place, the preaching of the gospel to the whole world and the apostasy from the faith. This is certainly the general apostasy of which St. Paul speaks in Second Thessalonians. Certainly. <coughs> what is left is the appearance of the Antichrist. And you can see the forces of that gathering. The, the, there is something about, uh, we'll, we'll call it the left, that is gaining force and, and, and uh, organization. I don't know what life is like in this country, but there is so much hatred in leftists in the United States that it is alarming. In all of my, I was born in 1950. It used to be that Democrats and Republicans, although opposed one to another, did not hate each other and they bore up with various administrations. And they were the loyal opposition in one or the other administration. Now there's just hate, hatred. And, and not only among politicians, but also among people who, who espouse the left. And they're actually violent with people who don't agree with them. And, and if you just say normal things that anyone would have said 50 years ago without being molested in any way, now people are beaten up for that. And you can see this, this, this gathering uh, of, a, of a persecution, a spirit of persecution of the Catholic faith. Uh, it may not happen in the next couple of years, but I could see down the line. This is not going to be something that will just die. There, there is a growing feeling of hatred for anything that is even natural, traditional. And uh, so I, I think that we could see the appearance of the Antichrist coming out of this. Also, all of the globalism, uh, in order to have an Antichrist, you have to have the whole world organized. And my opinion, this is only an opinion, I think all of the frenzy and fanaticism about the, the global warming, etc., is a way in which uh, pe- uh, to, to put people into a, f- a, uh, a panic uh, about something terrible that's going to happen. So we're all supposed to be dead by 2030, I think. And uh, so you know, that puts people in a panic. And when people are in a panic, they tend to do things that are extreme. And so they might accept, say, uh, you know, a, a global government or something like that. It's, it's just my opinion. I think that is, it's being pushed by all of the forces of the left. And you know, even if you wanted to say, well, maybe there's something to it. Maybe it's not a good idea to pump that much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the fanaticism of it makes you wonder about it. It's, 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 it's a panic. It's, it's, it's something that, that goes beyond it, what it should be. It might be a problem, and it should be addressed, but not, not fanatically. And, and whenever somebody is grinding an ax that much, I, I, in my opinion, 
it's time to, to take a long look at it. <clears throat> so I'm just saying that. I'm not trying to alarm you. I'm just saying that you can see this third condition, the appearance of the Antichrist, coming together, gelling. So uh, many commentators, if not most, uh, concerning the end of the world, add the conversion of the Jews to Catholicism as one of the conditions of the end of the world. Very common in all of the common, most of the commentators. They speculate that this will happen at the time of the great apostasy from the faith. Hence our own time. Since just as the gospel and the kingdom were taken from the Jews in the first century owing to their apostasy, so it is fitting that when the Gentiles become apostates, the gospel and the kingdom shall be given to the Jews. And this is clear in St. Paul, chapter 11 of Romans. He says it explicitly. Thus they will fulfill at the end of time what they should have been 2,000 years ago. Just as the conversion of Rome brought about an era of glory to the church, Rome being the superpower, so will the conversion of the Jews, owing to their immense influence and power, bring a period of glory to the church like none she has ever known before. This is in the commentators. While the events which will lead up to the end of the world are certainly to be feared, <clears throat> what is to be feared yet more is the general judgment of men. Whether this terrifying event of the end of the world should come in our own lifetimes or not, we should live our daily lives according to the dictates of the gospel so that with joy we will receive the words of the Savior. Come, ye blessed of my Father, possess you the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What wonderful words. What consoling words. This kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And we don't want to hear those chilling words which he will say to those on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, which was, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. For each one of us will hear one or the other of these words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.